Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me OK? Everyone at the back? Yeah? OK, great. If for any reason it cuts out, just wave your hands, and hopefully we can get this order out. So um, firstly, I'd, thank, I'd like to thank, um, thank, you, thank you for your time today. Um, and David, thanks for inviting me to be a part of the event today. I'm really excited to be here, really excited to be a part of this event, um, to do this talk, and also to, to be doing the workshop um, tomorrow. So I'm going to talk today about researchers in rickshaws. And um, this is a project that I ran last year with a, with a team uh, based in um, Seattle. And uh, I've been working at Google for um, three years now. And uh, I kind of fell into user experience. So I used to manage Usability Lab um, at Univ City University London. Panayotis, I think, is in the audience somewhere. There he is. Uh, so Panayotis um, was actually my first boss um, in, in this industry. And um, he gave me an opportunity to manage a usability lab and basically learn about user experience. I ended up staying there, learning about the craft, learning about how to do usability testing, the whole gamut of user experience and all that entails. And then eventually ended up um, at Google, where I work in a team that's responsible for doing um, international research and supporting product teams on doing international research from a usability um, uh, and a user experience perspective. The main areas that our team focuses on is on search and on Google Maps. Um, before everyone starts to come and say to me, something's not working with Google Maps, I can't be responsible for everything associated with Google Maps. Um, I have worked on a tiny part of it, but happy to discuss and, and learn about your experiences and also hear about your feedback on that as well. Um, so I thought it'd be interesting for the audience just to kind of talk a little bit about what user experience is like at Google and how the teams are set up. Um, and then after talking a little bit about that, I can give some background into the project that I worked on, and then we'll have some time at the end for some questions. There's loads of Venn diagrams here because I couldn't find an easy way to communicate this, so I apologize in advance. Um, so basically, user experience at Google is split up into these four areas. So you've got web developers, visual designers, UX researchers, interaction designers, and prototypers. This is constantly evolving and constantly changing. When I first started out um, in user experience, it just tended like you'd just have one UX person that would be doing everything. Um, and as the discipline is evolving, um, specifically at, at Google, there are now specialities and people that specialize in certain areas, and then they kind of are responsible for that piece. Um, Google is a highly collaborative environment, and um, you're often working very, very closely with all of the different types of teams. Um, as a researcher, I often am talking with um, pr prototypers, developers, visual designers, and we also have a, a content writers team as well. So we have UX writers, um, in, in another addition to this ever-evolving um, UX um, discipline. So UX itself now comes into its own category, and then you have product managers and engineers. Um, engineers uh, typically tasked with actually building the product. Um, product managers are kind of responsible for making sure that everyone kind of runs according to the schedule, everything is delivered on time, as well as um, coordinating with marketing um, and other teams just to make sure that when the product is actually launched, it has the right impact um, and it hits the right notes in terms of providing a good message to the users. There are a lot of engineers at Google, so um, it's an engineering company, and there are a lot of situations where you might, have, you might be the only researcher in the room, um, and then you're talking to a lot of engineers, designers, and PMs. Um, so one of the skills I think that you'd need as a, as a researcher, I mean, just generally in any kind of environment, not only, on, only at Google, is really being good to kind of communicate the value of research as well as bringing in insights from whatever kind of research that you're doing be that usability testing, be that immersive field research, be it market research, whatever kind of way that you're trying to bring in insights that's what's going on in the external world outside of what's happening and what the product is, that's going to be of benefit and of value. And the, the, way, the, the best way that you can do that is just having regular meetings and kind of being, having them feel like they're involved in the process. So I spoke a little bit about how the teams are set up. Um, about two years ago, towards the end of, um, end of the year in 2014, one of the team um, members approached um, our, our unit and asked us, uh, we've been asked to create an experimental transport application for users in India. And uh, we're just going to go and build it. 
And uh, from, the, from our team, we were tasked with actually now providing some, some level of insight into this development process and making sure that the team could actually be really mindful of the way in which they're building this product. So as a researcher, your first question is, who are you designing for? Right? What, is your, what is the target user base? What do you know about your user? And uh, the team at the time kind of had a very, very basic understanding of the potential user market. So it was somebody in India maybe has got a smartphone, maybe maybe he's had a smartphone for six to 12 months. Before that, they were using a feature phone. Now they want to use, uh, and they're regular users of public transportation. That was about it in terms of how much they were had, had insight of exactly what the users was about. So again, being a researcher, being in this situation with a team where I, I'm responsible for making sure that the product is actually user-centered and, and, and can kind of have user insights, my suggestion was, why don't we all go to India and understand what's happening in India so that we can better design, we can empathize with users, and then build a product that has, has, has people that have experience in, in being in, in Delhi and using the public transportation. Why did I do this? Um, the team is based in Seattle. And um, while some of them had been to India, a lot of them had not been to India. And um, for someone that's living in Seattle, your day-to-day -day commutes look a lot like this. Um, there's probably traffic, OK, fair enough. But this tends to be your day-to-day -day commute. So if you're building an app, if you're building something, and you have this kind of mindset, this is how it is, this is how it is, obviously you're naturally going to be inclined to be reverting to this, because this is the experiences that you've had. In India, it's slightly different. So, in India, you have loads of people on the streets. You have loads of different types of transportation. You have rickshaws, you have bicycles, you have animals. Like, there's, there's tons of things happening. It's a very colorful environment. It's a, it's a great place. I love going to India. I'm from India. And um, I was also really excited to take teams um, into, into environments like this so that they could really understand what it's like as a user in this kind of environment. Because that has implications on how you would then use a product or a service. Furthermore, there's like, there's, there's people like, they've got like a tricycle and tires, and he's on the phone, and then there's another rickshaw. It's just like, there's just chaotic, chaotic things happening all the time. And I really wanted to take the team to understand this, because even showing pictures like this alone does not give you a really good understanding of what it's like to be in this environment, the scorching heat, and how that can influence how you're trying to um, interact with the device to try and get information. So I managed to persuade the team. Uh, we, had, we had a process where we kind of prepare a proposal uh, in which we list exactly what the plan is, how long everything's going to take, what we already know about the market, and what we stand to learn have after we take teams out. Because from Seattle to India, it's an 18-hour flight. So it's a substantial investment. You're taking the engineering teams out of their day-to-day -day work to be involved in this project. So you have to justify to the company that this is a good dis business decision. So there is a, there is a process um, that we followed, but as I mentioned, our team is tasked with doing this. So we were able to kind of get the, get the buy-in from the team and um, have them out joining, joining us for this research. And uh, one of the things actually that I'd, I'd want to add here is that um, we did try and work with the local teams as well. Um, we have offices um, everywhere um, in India. We have like four or five offices. And uh, we were really fortunate because we had people that were based in those offices that we could kind of work with and help us with doing some of this research. And again, this is a good opportunity to build bridges with other teams, again, just to kind of keep, keep the collaboration opportunities open within the company. So once we've got everyone on the plane, we go out into the field, what did we do? Um, just before that, actually, we did this. We did desk research. So um, as I mentioned, when we were doing the proposal, um, it's really important to understand what you know about the market before going into the field. So at Google, there's, there's been a history of re researchers that have done work in India, not only on, for Google Maps, for Google Search, for YouTube, for Chrome, for Android, for a, 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 a gamut of different things. Um, and there's, there's likely to be some things that uh, we could learn before going into the market that would be useful and beneficial for us before getting on that plane. 
So we spent some time in actually going through all of the research that we have internally. We have a, a really good um, internal archive of, of all the research that we can use. And um, we documented all of that. And then we also looked at external trend reports. So external research houses, research ag agencies that prepare these big reports about the state of connectivity in India, for example. Um, and what this process allows you to do is answer any questions that you already have um, before having to go out into the field. And uh, it just saves you having to reinvent the wheel because then you, when you're going out into the field, you already have like, a very basic understanding of, of what, hap what is happening in the market. And in some situations, all we do is desk research because well, we don't have the necessary time to actually go out into the field. Um, so this is a really important part of, of the research process. Um, I can't stress this enough. I think that this can really offer a lot of value. Um, when it's done appro appropriately and when it's done right. So once we got out into the field, um, we did something known as home visits. So these are very, very long interviews, two hours in somebody's house, um, learning about everything to do with their device, how they access the internet, what, what smartphone that they have, how long that they've had it how they get information about um, news, how do they get information about traveling to different places, how often are they traveling to different places. We have a full script, and we go through all of those scripts. Often we would have a translator, because in some situations the participants weren't super comfortable in speaking in English, so we would have a translator that's um, running the session with us. And um, this is uh, Russell and Dave, who were the, um, these were the product managers. As I mentioned, the way that the team is built up, so these were the PMs. We also had the engineering teams out with us. Um, and it's so, so, so powerful to have everyone. You can't just take product managers. You can't just take engineers. You can't just take researchers or designers. You need to take everyone. Because if you do that, you bring those different perspectives with you. And, and as, as the earlier comments was, you need to, you can't be pro proposing solutions as a designer that aren't feasible for an engineer. And the only way that you're going to actually come up with feasible, credible solutions is if you have everybody in the field working together, taking the notes. Because as a researcher, when you're out in the field and you're doing this kind of work, you actually do the easy thing because you're, you coordinated everything. So you're, you're the one that's building the rapport with the participant. You're guiding them through the tasks. You're working through all of the exercises with them. And your product managers and your engineers are the ones that are taking notes. And uh, for those of you who have, has anyone, OK, so how often have those that, who've done usability testing had engineers or some product managers involved in the process? Can I get a show of hands? OK, good. And um, those kinds of situations, I think you'd agree, are, are really great because it, it makes them invested in the research. And they feel like it's a part of, 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 of what they're doing. And they're likely to have more ownership over the insights and the report and everything that comes out of it and actually make that happen. And it's the exact same thing here. Um, so this was a really uh, an, an important thing for us to do and making sure that we have various different perspectives involved on the research front. We also recorded these sessions as well. Um, and this can, come, this can prove to be very useful when you're doing the analysis. Um, the analysis can take a couple of days, a couple of weeks, and it can also take a month, depending on how much time you have, what kind of project it is, how many post-its you have, because obviously a lot of post-its get used up and plastered all over the wall. Um, but those, all of those things um, actually do have an impact on, on the timing. And um, what's really valuable is having video footage that you can go back to so that you can remind yourself of what was said during the sessions. It's not just two hours of just talking. We have some exercises that we do. So this is a card sorting exercise, um, which many of you are, are probably familiar with, in which we ask the users to actually prioritize different types of information. So the, the example here was uh, we had all of these different types of information, and we asked users, how would you prioritize this? What is the most important piece of information for you to have? Um, and then once they provided that, we would then ask them, um, how often do you want each of these types of information? And this was a good exercise from us because the, the wider kind of research question for this project was also around Google search and how are people meeting their Google search needs. And um, in addition to that, we did want to find out the piece about the transportation, which is why you can see travel there. 
Another thing that we did was um, interviews in the street. And uh, this is actually my favorite technique, because when you're doing the home interviews, you normally work with an agency. You tell them who you want to recruit. You say, I'm looking for a participant that is between this age group, has this level of income, has this kind of smartphone, has this level of um, familiarity with technology. And you, you walk in kind of already knowing the type of person you're going to be speaking with. When we're doing these street interviews, it's literally approaching someone at random on the street and just saying, do you have five to 10 minutes of your time? And you could be speaking to anyone. And you could come up with some really interesting things or some not so interesting things. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a really exciting and interesting environment because you could speak to you could be in a high-end mall and you could be speaking to someone that's an iPhone user. Or you could be speaking to someone in like a, a bus terminal and they're using a feature phone that you haven't seen for a very long time. It's a really, really old Nokia that looks like it's been passed down from like generations. And you have like a total like bandwidth, like broad spectrum of different um, types of people. But it's interesting to talk to each of those and understand, well, obviously they all have some fundamental re reasons to get access to information. So what are the differences and how are they getting access to that information across the different devices that they have? Um, so very, very good um, kind of a technique. And it's a lot more of, obviously, it's a shortened down version of what I described in the home interviews. Um, in this type of interview, it's a script that lasts maybe 10 to 15 minutes. And you have a number of questions. And in, in those questions, there's also tasks where, would you, can you please show me how you do this? And this is an example of the user showing um, Dave, who was the, um, the product manager, how he was using Google Maps. So another thing that happens when you do these kind of street intercepts, interviews, is that uh, you start attracting attention. So SAS and um, Aditi here are doing some, um, they're intercept interviewing this participant over here who's, I think he's sitting on a fridge freezer or a sink. Um, he was just, yeah, he was just chilling there. And uh, this guy over here just all of a sudden started getting really curious to see what was happening. And uh, I don't know if any, any of you have done research in India. It's, it's such a cool place to do research because you just see the most amazing things. And, 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 and a lot of the things that really stick out about the culture of India and, 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 and how people behave and interact with one another. So in some situations when you're doing intercepts, so this is what we told the team. We said to them, you, there might be situations where random people will just stop and stare at you just to see what's going on because it's quite unfamiliar to them. Uh, and this was an example of a mild version of that. So this is an example of you know, how, how that might happen, because you've got one person that's kind of curious to see what happens. This is an extreme example where like, we were at a train station, and Army, this big, tall American engineer, was talking to this one guy and asking him, so how do you find out about buses, and how do you get information about trains and stuff? And then everyone, all of a sudden, was interested, and everyone was adding in their own questions, and giving in some, some feedback and some answers. And it just became like a focus group, like in the middle of a train station. Uh, it was really cool. Uh, I don't know what's in that box, but it looks like it's leaking. And he was just like standing there like this, just observing what was happening. Um, again, so this, this is the type of thing that can happen in these environments. It's a really cool um, space to be in. And you know, we have a script, and we have like a, a structure of, of what we want to find out and how we want to um, get these questions answered. But there's no reason that we have to stick to that structure. And for those of you who have run usability testing, you don't have to go by the script. If there's anything else that catches your interest or something else that the participant says, you can go off on a tangent. And we actually ended up spending like 20 minutes talking to this group that we had and, and asking them um, about uh, the various different types of information that they had. I'm just going to grab some water. <coughs> So the other thing that we did was to try and build even more empathy. So we've spoken to people in their homes, get that really deep understanding. We've spoken to them on the street to try and, and at various locations as well. Uh, we choose the locations depending on the kind of person that we want to speak to. Um, and we've got kind of a, you know, we've broadened out the types of pers person that we're, we're speaking with. The third thing that we did was immersion. And, um, Immersion basically involves using devices that are typical to that market, apps that are typical to that market, and then just traveling. So I had prepared 
a list and an itinerary. And uh, I told the team, OK, guys, here's your phone. Put, your, put away your Nexus devices. Put away your you know, high-end phones. You've all got like a local phone, which has like, I think it had four, megabyte, four gigabytes of RAM. Um, and it had very little storage. And you had to down, delete. To install another app, you had to delete like four apps. It was just a really, really shitty, shitty phone. Um, and we were like, this is the phones that a lot of people are using. So you now have to use this phone. You have to install the apps. You can use Google Maps or whatever it is that you want to use. But you need to travel from here to this part of town. And then from that part of town, you need to go here. You only have to use public transport. Although Uber is available in India, you're not allowed to use Uber. Uh, you have to kind of use public transport, use metro, use buses. You can use rickshaws and then travel around. So that was like the brief that I gave them. And uh, I was there, but I was kind of just observing and taking notes and just watching how they were doing this. Um, and seeing how they were experiencing Google Maps through these devices, just to see, was Google Maps working? Was it, was it performing on these lower end devices, or was it, was it falling short? Um, in addition to that, we were using other applications that had kind of seen that there's an opportunity to to develop some solutions for these lower-end phones and provide information to users. So there were local apps that had been built in India uh, for, for Indian users. And we wanted to kind of see how well those are working compared to Google Maps. So we spent a full day going through this. And there'd be, there'd be times in the day where we'd regroup and we'd sit down and go through all of the, um, all of the different apps and kind of share our experiences. So, what worked for you, how, how did this kind of um, meet or not meet your expectations. And there was a lot of kind of sharing of, of ideas um, and a lot of discussion that happened around this. We were kind of involved in doing more of these interviews while we were doing this immersion as well. So anytime we find an opportunity, we wanted to kind of speak to um, users. And we have bus drivers. We have this guy who's got that same curiosity. He wants to know why I'm taking a picture on the bus. He's just staring straight back at me. Uh, so this is Sanket and Sean. And they were, they were taking notes because they were interviewing the bus conductor. And they were saying to him, well, how often is somebody asking you about the bus stop? When are they asking you when to get off at the bus stop or how to get to a certain place? What kind of information are they asking for you? What kind of phones do you normally see that people have? So just asking all these different types of questions just to get as much information as possible um, from this trip. Uh, and as I mentioned, we'd then come back at the end of the day and uh, sit down, digest everything, think about who we've spoken to, talk about the experiences that we've had, talk about how this relates to the product that we're building, learn about how much we can actually take from this um, into the product thinking. And uh, we did work very long days. So we'd have like the full day of immersion, then we'd be doing, um, oops, we'd be doing um, this kind of analysis at the end of the day. And it could, Sometimes we had situations where we tried different methods. So we would sometimes have people doing presentations. So if you, have, if you have five minutes to talk to the rest of your team about what you've learned today, what would you say in those five minutes? And then we'd go around the room saying, and just kind of seeing what are the main takeaways that everyone's um, having from this. Because in this room, you've obviously got the engineer that's going to build the product. You've got the product manager that's going to actually oversee everything. You've got someone in marketing. So you want to know what are their main takeaways. And as a researcher, this is easy for you because you just capture all of this, and then that's your report done. So it's, it's, it's really good to kind of have that as a way to help you accelerate the process for delivering these insights. So another factor of the research that we did, and this was once we came back um, into, once we came back from the field, was doing remote user testing. So I actually sit in the London office. And uh, we worked with an agency in, um, in Delhi who was running the participant recruitment and the usability testing for us. And the moment that we had the final product or the first version of the product that was in a shareable state, we tested that with users. And this started very early on from low fidelity prototypes. So they were paper-based mocks. Then they slowly became clickable prototypes. Then it, was, it became higher and higher fidelity. Um, and then in the final round of research, we actually had a fully functional prototype um, that we were testing. And this was really good because 
we weren't committing engineering resources to build this. Um, and it, at this stage, I was working really closely with the designer on the project. And we were just trying out some different concepts and different ideas that we had. So one of the other things that I wanted to do was really try and capture the experience of being in India for the team members that weren't able to make it. Um, so there were some, some team members that, due to um, family commitments, weren't able to take the trip uh, and come and join us. And I really wanted, to have, I w really wanted them to have an experience um, as, as good as uh, those that were out in the field with us. So I, I've, I'm going to talk a little bit about the kit that I kind of had um, to try and help, help me with that. So I, was, I wore a GoPro um, on my chest in 50 degrees heat, which was very uncomfortable. And uh, I wanted to try and kind of show like a point of view of how someone uses the bus, how someone uses the metro. And uh, again, this was something that I wanted to be able to share back with the team so that they can really get that experience and understand from the moment that you're leaving your, your, your place, buying the ticket, your interaction with the ticket machine, your interaction with the bus conductor, getting on the bus, getting off the bus, getting on the metro, that whole um, experience, I wanted to capture that. So that's why we chose to use GoPro. Um, we also had a backpack that had notepads, notepads, chargers, and spare phones. We needed chargers because the phones that we were using, as I mentioned, were lower in phones, and um, the battery doesn't last very long. So we had these massive power banks that we'd keep plugging the phones back into like every hour or so. Um, and another thing that I wanted to do, because in India, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but in India, there is still a, 2G is still widely the, the way that people are connecting to the internet beyond 3G. 3G, 4G are available, but 2G is by and large the way that most people connect online. And I wanted to simulate this, so I had a phone that I was tethering. So when, when they were all using those low-end phones, they were tethered, tethered to my phone, and it was a really slow, excruci excruciatingly slow experience. And again, just to try and build that empathy and get them to empathize with the users. Cameras are so important. Um, this is, I can't, I can't stress this enough. Um, one of the things that comes back from the research that can actually really give a lot of impact is good photography and good imagery. And uh, what, what you end up finding is some of the pictures that you take get presented to VPs, get presented like to the rest of the company at org level, um, and also just really help capture the experience, capture the moment, and capture things that are, are really unique to a particular environment or a particular market. And uh, we have really good, we had good cameras, and we gave everyone a camera, uh, and we encouraged everyone to take as many pictures as possible. Um, because you can capture things that identify, like can really pick out flaws and pain points. So this was another user that was just like plugged into the, um, the socket at a train station, obviously, because power is an issue. And, you know, I could talk for hours and say, oh, well, power's a big issue and everyone has sensitivities, but this shows you, like, he's gone to the trouble of carrying a charger with him. Any opportunity that he can plug and get some power, he takes. So again, it just helps to communicate um, a need and so that, so that it can have more impact. But it's also fun to take pictures of things that are a little bit unfamiliar to you, like someone just chilling in the back of a pickup truck um, and going, going somewhere. And it, I mean, it's a form of transportation, but it's, it's cool to kind of capture some of the essences of these markets because it can be really um, powerful, when, especially when you're talking about trying to bring some personality into branding because you can have it localized to a particular culture. So we did this crazy experience. We took the teams out. We had them riding the buses, riding the rickshaws, learning about users, learning about their pain points. What did we learn? What was, what was the big takeaways from this research? What did we learn about our user? One of the things that came out from the research was that there isn't a central source of information. So we were, the, this research was based in Delhi. And um, we wanted to try and understand how someone travels around in Delhi using the bus network. And on one of these occasions, we were trying to get from this bus terminal to the shopping mall. And this is the inquiry box. And there was one there was one person in there, and uh, we were asking them, okay, so we wanted to, I think it was the 721 bus. So we were asking him, when, how often does the 721 bus come? Because we need to take that. Because we were waiting for ages. 
and it didn't look like anything was happening. So we were like, are we on the wrong place? Are we at the wrong bus stop? What's going on? So we asked this guy, we're like, can you help us? We're trying to get to this, um, to this shopping mall. Is bus 721 the right bus? He said, yes, it's the right bus. So we asked him, okay, so how long will it take? And he just looked at us and he said, it will take some time. <laughs> and <laughs> so we were like, okay, fine, so let's just go back and wait. And just, we just sat there and waiting for the, waiting for the bus. And it, but the thing was, the, the information is all over the place. It's disparate. But when we did some digging, we did uh, like some of our own internal research, it turns out that there is online timetables for all of the buses in Delhi, but they're just not presented anywhere. And you know, one of the missions for Google as a company is to organize the world's, uh, organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and relevant. And this is a perfect opportunity to do that because it wasn't organized and it wasn't accessible uh, and it is in incredibly relevant for, for the users. So this was one of our big takeaways and it kind of really reinforced to us that there is definitely a need for a product that can provide this information for users because currently it's kind of all over the place and, and it, it, there's no central source of information. Another thing that we identified from the research was people have phones that are very different to phones we're using and we're comfortable with using and we're familiar with using. And just as the analogy that I gave at the very beginning of the talk, talking about the different ways in the roads and how the roads are structured, if you're using a Nexus 5 or an iPhone all day, you have a very different mental model and understanding of what is possible and what you think that you can throw at a user. Whereas if this is the day in, day, day, in, day out way that someone's interacting with the internet um, through a device like this, again, they have different sensitivities. One of the biggest pain points that we found from um, users using devices like this was storage. To total space is 1.95 gigabytes. And there's pictures is 3.35. So there's a massive culture of sharing photos and Bollywood MP3s and all of these kinds of um, media. And users are very, very strict about what they will put on their device. And it needs to, be, it needs to have have some kind of entertainment or necessity purpose. And uh, we really wanted to make sure whatever we built was sensitive to this concern. The other thing that we found was internet connection isn't great. And uh, you, could be, you could be in a city like Delhi, which is the capital city, and um, all of a sudden, your internet just dies, it just drops out. You, you, you had like full bars and then you've got nothing. And, and this is a common problem that we heard from the users and it was a real frustration for them. And if we're assuming that, oh, well, everyone, everyone in, is gonna have constant access to, to, to the internet, we don't need to build anything so that we can kind of like have anything offline, then you're excluding a massive proportion of users, especially in markets where connectivity can be quite spotty. So we really wanted to see if we make sure that we addressed this concern from users as well. And 87% of users are still on a 2G connection, which I don't know if you still get 2G in Estonia, but it's slow, really slow. Sometimes we get it in London if you're at a train, there's Clapham Junction train station and you get it there and it's like you can see a little E on your reception bar and it's, it's not a nice feeling. Um, and you know, we, want, we wanted to kind of help, help the team understand this and also just make sure that whatever product that we build, we don't leave our users feeling frustrated in these situations because the time when you're out and you're going somewhere, you might be going to a job interview or you might be meeting someone. That's the least time you want your technology to fail on you. That's the time that you have to depend on it the most. And uh, you know, it makes it really more powerful of a kind of justification for having some kind of offline capability. So the other thing that we started to unpick, and this was when we were talking to people that were coming online for the first time, was that whilst we think and kind of Google is kind of um, looked at as you know, being very simple and there's a lot of praise around the simplicity of the search interface. Now, it's great, but this assumes you know everything that's behind this white box. And if you imagine someone that hasn't grown up with the internet, hasn't grown up with dial-up, 
it's a very, very different experience. And uh, we would be talking to people and saying to them, well, why don't you try and search for this information? But they don't know what to search for. They don't know how to write the query. They don't know how to articulate it is. English isn't their first language. They might not be comfortable in typing. There's all of these different factors, all of these different boundaries. Um, so something as simple as search, how we know it, isn't actually that great from, like, from a perspective of discovering content if, if you're coming online for the very first time and you have very little exposure. So this was a really important learning and an important takeaway for us uh, in, in terms of thinking about how we can design our product to help be more um, informative uh, rather than relying on the user to formulate and the user to kind of like give information. And just to kind of bring that point again, like from the mature markets, I'm sure many of you around the room remember the dial-up sound that used to come when you were connecting to the internet. Um, in emerging markets, that, that didn't even happen. Like the internet first happened on a feature phone and then, then on a smartphone and now on tablets. Uh, so paradigms, metaphors associated with desktop, like a floppy disk, which I've still seen in some apps, make no sense whatsoever to users. Um, and you know, as designers and researchers, we should be very mindful of this, especially because we're now, everyone is building global products. And uh, we need to really be thinking about when users actually jumped on the bandwagon and, and how much experience they've had before that. So what was the result? after this whole adventure that we did. This was the app that we built. So you can download it, it's Delhi Public Transport app. It's, um, it's designed, as I mentioned, it's an experimental app, so it was designed just for Delhi. And um, it allows users to get information about buses and metros, and it also, also provides alerts about disruptions um, that happen. One of the reasons why we decided to have the alerts was that when we were doing the interviews, we were visiting a user um, in another part of town. And because it's the capital city, there's loads of protests that happen. And when a protest happens, literally, it just, like, and it can just happen sporadically. And we were, we were about to go to a, a participant's home. And all of a sudden, this group of people just came and just sat in the road. And we were like, what's happening here? They're like, it's a protest. Like, how long is this going to last? It's a protest. And like, no one knew what the protest was about, how long it was going to last. We just kind of had to wait there and, and then just see what happens. Um, there, is some, there is some advanced notice, because obviously there, there, there needs to be some kind of um, notice given and planning given to, to, the, um, to the central authority. So we want to try and kind of incorporate this into that as well, just to inform users if there are going to be any disruptions. Uh, and that was one of the other justifications that we had for, for the alerts. The three things that we set out for this app to do was to make it offline. Because, as I mentioned, we didn't want users to be in those situations where the connectivity suddenly drops and then they lose access to that information. And again, they just felt like you know, it's let them down. We wanted to have a really simple UI, um, not having too much information, not relying the user to kind of recall everything. One of the other things that we had is we had a very aggressive um, auto-suggest that was built into the, to the app. So just to give you some um, information on that, if you were to tap on the search for the directions, the, the moment you tap a letter, you just automatically see suggestions. And again, this was to kind of help users. I mean, if you look at uh, design principles, it's uh, recall, recall, recognition over recall. Uh, and this was basically catering to that design principle. Just pr making it very easy for users to recognize words, names of places, rather than having them to type the whole query and then hit a search. The final thing was the small file size. So I mentioned that people have um, very, the devices kind of don't have massive capacities. So everything, every app that is installed is a very long, drawn out process. And sometimes apps are just deleted. And uh, we wanted to make sure that the app was really catered so that it would work on these devices. Um, I had an animation that shows the Google. I don't know if you've seen it, but there's this Google animation that kind of like has got these four circles. Um, that animation is one megabyte. That's the same size of the app that we built. So um, it was really good to kind of the team, the engineering team did an amazing job. And, and they were able to 
bring something down that had all the information about bet metros, buses, it had an uh, index in there, you could search, you could set favorites, you could have the alerts. And it basically encompassed all of that within one megabyte, which was an amazing achievement for the team. What was the response? So in the first two weeks, we had 10,000 downloads. Now, this is obviously not big by Google standards, but I was really happy about it um, because, again, this is a targeted experiment for a very specific part of India, and uh, there, was, there was some marketing, but very little marketing. And it was just, we expected this to kind of grow by word of mouth. And one of the other features that we had within the app was the ability to share the app via WhatsApp. Um, and again, from the research that we, that we did, there was this, a lot of things were being shared via WhatsApp, um, MP3s, photos, media. And uh, we wanted to try and be, allow users to have a, an easy way to do that as well. So you know, that was another reason that we wanted to kind of have this process like a little bit outside of the Play Store, and that was a great opportunity for us. So one of the Play Store reviews that we had from the user, so this is uh, somebody who's saying that this is a great app for people using, learning to use handheld technology for the first time, or those who are 40 years old and might not have had a college education. It is targeted at the multitudes using public transport in Delhi and will do a far better job than most other apps at this. And this was great to hear, because this, this was clearly someone who could understand the type of user that we were designing for and, 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 and could actually relate to them and basically see what we were trying to achieve with this product. And we got loads of stars, which was really nice as well. So what now? So since that project, um, I've been working with other teams on trying to learn what we can take away from this experience. Again, this was an experiment, and it was just to kind of see can we build a product for a specific, very specific use case? How can we build a product that has so much research focus uh, and has such a research, you know, so much research involved? It was experimental from that perspective as well because we hadn't done a, a project like this. Um, so whilst from the product side, it was like, okay, we want to try and build this new app, let's see how it goes. We were like, we want to try these new, new techniques, we want to try and see if we can do immersion, field intercepts, interviews, and see how that all works with the product teams. So the next steps are now doing this with other parts of Google Maps and other teams within Google Maps, and just to kind of help to bring them into these environments and help them to empathize with users. There are offline maps that has recently been launched um, in India. And this is kind of getting towards that point of you know, providing access to information when internet connectivity um, isn't around. So there are very, very, a various number of initiatives that uh, I'm currently involved in that are kind of trying to see through some of the work that we learned um, from this project. So I kind of wanted to close off by saying that I think this kind of research is really important, really powerful, um, and it's great to be in front of an audience like you, who are going to be people that are going to be designing the products, right? And uh, this is going to be for the next billion users that are coming online for the first time. And it's our responsibility to kind of be very mindful of people that are coming from these backgrounds, coming from these kinds of level of experiences, um, economic backgrounds, educational backgrounds, and making sure that whatever products that we're building are catered to these types of users and are mindful of some of the constraints and sensitivities that these users have. And uh, I think that it's, it's a great opportunity for anyone that's in this field right now to kind of really be building products because you really have a lot to learn from all of these different markets and the ways in which people are interacting with technology and, and the, the rate at which it's moving in different markets is, is astounding. And you're, it's, it's great to be a part of that. So I hope today I've been able to give you some, something to take away and some techniques that you can potentially try, or, try at, at, your, at your leisure. Um, one of the feedback that I've had when I've spoken to other researchers that, that don't work at Google is we can't all just jump on a plane and, and travel and try and do this kind of research, which is true. Um, but I think there's always ways in which you can learn about users. And because there's so many tools now that you can actually have remote interviews and remote usability testing happening, there's no reason why you can't reach out to people 
on the other side of the world and just kind of understand what their perspective is. Um, so we have the tools. We should be making use of them. Thank you.